It's obviously important to teach our learners new skills, but it's just as important to make sure that previously mastered skills are generalized and maintained. So what are the best ways to incorporate generalization and maintenance into our learners' programming? Hi, I'm Shira. And I'm Shana. We are behavior analysts that create weekly content about how to teach kids with autism so that they make real progress. And we create shareable resources to make your jobs just a little easier. Today's topic is all about generalization and maintenance. And if you want more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated on new video releases. So my daughter just came home from sleepover camp and she was telling me stories, but while she was at sleepover camp, she just sweep the floor every night right after dinner. And I just kind of started laughing to myself because this is a kid who I don't think has ever picked up a broom before in her life. And even after camp, she's still not sweeping the floor at home. And to me as a parent, it's really frustrating because I actually do want her to sweep the floor at home. Um, so why does she do it at sleepover camp, but won't do it at home? I mean, really from an ABA perspective, that's a generalization issue. So what is generalization? Generalization is the ability to show the same skill under different conditions. So that includes different people, different material, different places. It means that if I learn to sweep the floor at sleepover camp, I'm also going to sweep it at home because that's the same skill, same need, and I'm doing it in different places. So it's really important that we think about generalization when we're teaching our learners, because very often we can get very specific about the skills that we're learning in very specific situations, and we forget to diversify those situations so that our learners can generalize those skills. Yeah, and you know what? It's okay when a student's first learning a skill that maybe they're learning with one specific set of materials or they're learning it in one specific environment or with, you know, maybe two instructors and that's it. And that's okay because that's maybe what they need when they're first learning the skill. But really quickly as ABA therapists, we have to think about how are we going to generalize that skill to everyday life? Right. So when they're learning something new, they might be learning it, like Shane, I'm saying very specifically. And then we start introducing new materials um, kind of changing the rules a little bit so that they're not only showing us that they can identify that this specific picture is a cup or that this specific cup is a cup, but that, you know, um, a water bottle might also be a cup and this shape cup might also be called a cup. And not only that, but when I ask them what it is, they could say that it's a cup, but also when their sister asks them what it is or their teacher asks them what it is, they could respond with the same answer because that answer and that skill can generalize across people and across materials. So when I was first learning ABA 20 years plus ago, wow, um, you know, I was always taught, okay, first you teach the skill and then you generalize the skill and then you maintain the skill. And that's not always the case anymore. I mean, when I put together a program right from the very beginning, I'm thinking about maintenance and generalization. And the reason is, is because if you're not teaching something right from the get-go that is ever going to maintain or generalize across settings, what's the point in even teaching it? You're really just wasting that learner's time. So right from the very beginning, you know, if I'm teaching somebody what a cup is, I'm not going to just use one cup. I'm going to use five different examples of cups right from the very beginning. Um, and then I'm going to also, you know, teach that program, you know, at the table, but I'm going to teach it in the kitchen. If I've got access to a kitchen, I might teach it, you know, in at snack time that it's a cup in the natural environment. And I'm going to be teaching it in a whole bunch of different places, almost right from the beginning so that kids can generalize that right away. And something that I've seen teachers do to help with generalization, because we often have a lot of goals that we're working on with the kid and a lot of team members who work with that student. So teachers will have, you know, a place on the wall where they've listed students' current goals. And it could just be all the students' communication goals, all the students' life goals, whatever that is that the focus is. And they list all their goals. That way, anyone coming into the room can easily help work on those goals. And that really helps with generalization because it's not just in this one place with this one person that you're learning to show this skill, but everybody together is working on that skill and generalizing that to different people, places, and materials. 
Absolutely. And, you know, if you've got some type of secure method in terms of video and being able to share video with parents, um, being able to share some video, for instance, if you're teaching a student to sweep the floor, um, I'm stuck on this sweeping now, aren't I? Um, but brushing their teeth, tying their shoes, any type of life skill that is very important to generalize to parents as quickly as possible, seeing if you can get video of it again in a very secure way um, and showing parents so that they can see that. And what do they say? A picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, having a parent see that and then incorporate that into their daily routine at home so that it's just practiced every day is fantastic. And something that um, I've heard from Dr. Pio Gerhardt in teaching our kids that, you know, life skills are one big, you know, need to generalize. We are only going to be as successful as our students are in their next environment. So if we've taught our students tons of skills because we can control the environment and we know exactly the conditions that they need to be able to learn the skill, and then we send them off to their next setting, whether that's another classroom or a high school or adulthood or their home or whatever that next setting is, and those skills aren't being generalized, then we've not been successful. It's a lot more effective to pick a couple skills that we can generalize and that they will take into their next setting than thinking of you know tens or hundreds of skills that we can work on in very specific conditions. Absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about generalization, I keep thinking about, you know, ABA 101, and there's certain terms that come up. And two of those terms are stimulus generalization and response generalization. And what are those terms? And what's the difference between them? So, you know, when you're looking at stimulus generalization, you're really looking at that, you know, generalization with stimuli. So if a student is presented with a um, a stimuli that's different, that stimuli or those conditions change a little bit, can the student still respond in the same way? So for instance, you know, if they are going into an elevator and, uh, you know, the elevator buttons look different than the next elevator, can they still press the right floor? Or if they are sweeping, back to the sweeping thing, if the broom looks a little bit different, can they still do it? Um, you know, way back when I started ABA, we were always told to use our therapy voice. And I can't stand it. I don't recommend it anymore at all. But we used to say, sit down, good, that sit down. And students would respond, but as soon as they got into a classroom and the teacher said, okay, everyone have a seat, they couldn't respond. So making sure our students can respond to multiple examples of different things and they're responding the same way each time to those things is what stimulus generalization is. Do you want to take a shot at response generalization or do you want me to go for it? Go for it. <laughs> Response generalization is really about can they change their response in a very generalized way. So, you know, if they're seeing the same stimuli over and over again, can they change their responding slightly? So what does that mean? That would mean that, you know, they see that same elevator button, but their hands are full. So instead of pressing it with their finger, they press it with their elbow or they press it with something else. So it's not just about, you know, um, I'm going to change. It's not about changing your responding. It's about giving the same response. Um, but or sorry, it's, it's about different responding with the same stimuli. So yes, it's the elevator button, but I can do a bunch of different things with it. Or, um, you know, it's a cup and I'm identifying that up, but the response generalization is that sometimes I sip it really nicely when I'm around my grandparents, but you know, when I'm around my friends, I slurp it because it's really funny and I get a great reaction from that. Another good example of response generalization has been teaching communication and language, right? We want that to be as natural and as generalized as possible. So we'll often right from the beginning teach multiple responses. So when you want something that someone took from you, you could say, give it back, it's mine, I don't like this. And those will all be taught at the same time because they are all the same, they're different responses that serve the same purpose. So that would be how we would teach response generalization because we always want those kind of responses to be natural. Absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about generalization, um, you know, it does go hand in hand with something called maintenance. And I think I've slipped in the word maintenance here a little bit. But, you know, let's talk about now what is maintenance, um, because maintenance does go hand in hand with generalization. Um, maintenance is really just about continued performance of a skill over time. So, you know, if we're teaching something, we're teaching, 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 you know, our students are getting reinforcement for, you know, the direct desired response. That's great. That's great. Great. You know what? They've gotten hundred percent. It's mastered. We, you know, put that program in a box, we close it up. It's gone. Will that student still maintain that skill over time? Will they still have, you know, learned that skill 
three years later? Can they still, you know, pull that out and use it? Um, and we really need to be thinking about this right from the get go too. And if you've done a great job with generalization all along, like, yes, you know what, I now know what a cup is, because you've shown me 50 million examples of a cup, I've used a cup, my parents use a cup at home, I've done it in this environment, and I've done it in this environment, I know what a cup is, chances are, it's going to be maintained over time. Um, what about something like, I don't know, a hammer? It sounds silly, but you know, that is a receptive label and expressive label that we teach children. Well, if they're, you know, trying to identify what a hammer is and they don't use a hammer in their real life, you know, um, they're not going to maintain that period. You know, maybe one of their parents is, you know, um, an electrician and needs to use a hammer at some point in time, or, you know, does some type of, some type of construction where so they see a hammer all the time, a hammer is an appropriate label to teach them. But if they have no access or experience with a hammer, it's not going to be one of my first labels that I teach. So when you think about, you know, introducing a new skill acquisition program right off the bat, you should be thinking about how are you going to maintain it later on? Or is this a skill that we'll maintain? And the answer to that is that if it's a functional skill right from the get-go and you're working on generalizing it, it hopefully should be, should maintain itself. You won't really need a maintenance schedule or anything because it's going to be used in their natural environment. I was recently doing a training on reinforcement for, you know, a couple people new into the field, very young. And um, they were saying, well, you know, if I offer him reinforcement after every time he does it, aren't they just going to expect it every time? And my response was, okay, you're all grown up now. How many of you are still getting an M&M &M after you go to the bathroom? But essentially we're all toilet trained, right? Like, and that's because of maintenance. What happens was you reinforce that skill a lot intensively each and every time. And then it goes into a, a maintenance system where you'll reinforce it intermittently, or maybe it'll be once a week or once every two weeks. And eventually that skill is maintained because it was accessing some sort of reinforcement and then a faded reinforcement schedule and then possibly intermittent reinforcement. And then ultimately you don't have to reinforce it anymore. And if we can still keep that scale and maintain that scale without clear reinforcement, then it's maintained. So when I was younger, I was taught a very clear maintenance schedule. So every single target that, you know, we taught kids had to be put on a quote unquote maintenance schedule. And I'm trying to remember what the maintenance schedule was, but it was like, you know, we had to do it, you know, one time a week, we said to run that whole program one time a week for three weeks. And then after three weeks, we did it one time every two weeks for three weeks. And then after that, it was one time a month. And then it was one time every three months for three months. And then it would just go into the abyss. And I mean, sometimes you need a formal maintenance schedule for some programs, um, but a lot of the programs, if you're doing a really great job with generalizing and accessing a lot of these things in the natural environment, and if you are doing a great job with teaching functional skills, these things really should just maintain over time. And a lot of our programs with it being taught across operants, um, a lot of the skills become cumulative. So we're never leaving any programs behind. We're constantly building on them. So if we've taught categories, then instead of like putting the categories away, we then might teach rooms and places as a type of category. And then we'll kind of build on that category to different categories that we can expand on who, what, where are kind of categories. So we're constantly using those mastered skills, like Shana said, in a functional way and in a way that continues to be relevant. So hopefully you don't need that strict maintenance schedule, but sometimes you do for a certain really important skills. And you do want to make sure that the skills that you may not be targeting right now are being maintained. The other thing to do is when we are talking about maintenance and generalization, um, follow up with parents. So once you have quote unquote closed a program or you're, you know, you're no longer teaching a life skills program, for instance, you know, you've said, okay, you know, uh, my student is able to brush his teeth now, let's send it home. And you just quote unquote send this program home and the parents are doing it at home. You're assuming the parents are, you know, having the student brush their teeth independently at least a couple times a day. You want to follow up with parents because what sometimes happens is A, you send these parents these programs home and parents have no idea even how they're supposed to run them. Or, you know, they're like my kid and pretend that they they can't do it anymore with, <laughs> with the skill, no matter how mastered it was in some place. Um, but they just like need some extra guidance. So you may need to A, you know, show them a video of how you did it. B, help them. You know, maybe the parents come into the center, maybe you go home and you show them and do a little bit of handoff, physical handoff that way in terms of showing them how you're running this program and how you're getting 
you know, their child independent. Um, and then from there, making sure that you're following up with parents on a regular basis. So that maintenance schedule that I was talking about that, you know, one time per week for three weeks, maybe that's a, hey, I'm going to check in with the parents one time a week for three weeks, and then one time every two weeks for three weeks. Maybe that's my maintenance schedule to check in with parents. So keep that in mind as well, is that just because you, you know, send a program home for parents to run doesn't mean that it's actually getting run. And there's a variety of factors um, the, for, for reasons why they're not doing that. And sometimes it's it's fun to include maintenance in your programming because otherwise you're just teaching kids things that are just new and hard for them. So it could be a good way to like break up some of the sessions, doing things that they really know and that are just a fun review. Sometimes we'll put it to fluency. So it is a good way to kind of break up the sessions. And a nice way to have that is to put, the, put a bunch of different programs on cue cards, things that are mastered, and each cue card could have a different um, SD or instruction or goal. And they, it could even be really fun. It could be like, you know, what does a duck say? Or tell me your favorite farm animal or different ways to like mix it up, um, making it fun. You could put it to a timer and see how many they could get in a minute. Uh, and those are good, fun ways to also break up the session while giving your client a little bit of confidence that like they do know some stuff because this is already, already mastered. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually mix in master targets of the same program. So for instance, if I'm targeting, I don't know, in front and behind with prepositions, I'll throw in like in on top and under something that they've already mastered within that same program, just so that a I'm maintaining the in on top under that they've got, um, as well as showing them that confidence and Sherry, you're right is like it just by, you know, doing some of that maintenance with students and, sh and it, it gives them more confidence like yes you know what they're not all hard programs I can do this for sure. So today we talked a lot about what generalization and maintenance are. Um, a big component, like we said, is introducing it from the get-go and always keeping that in mind. Natural environment teaching is a great way to do that. So check out our other video on how to incorporate natural environment teaching in ABA. And always think about how you're incorporating the generalization across people, places, stimuli, and maintenance across time for all of the skills that we're teaching. So click on the link in and around this video to get your free communication log so that you can communicate with parents or other therapists about mastered skills that can be generalized to other environments. And for more information on generalization and maintenance, click the link on or around this video or in the description to claim your free communication log. We also encourage you to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future videos and leave a like and comment below if you have further questions.